possible three movie review. The very first scene sets up a later conflict because this is a J.J. Abrams production and that's how he likes to start things. Basically, Ethan has been captured by the villain, Davian played by the brilliant actor Philip Seymour Hoffman who is given pretty little to do other than be intimidating, which he does pretty well. And a gun is being held to the head of someone that we don't know yet who it is, but it's clear that Ethan cares about her. And right after the opening credits, we realized that it's his fiance. That is thus the emotional core for this film, and I'll get in more into that after I go over the rest of the plot. Ethan is brought back into active duty, in spite of having been a teacher for a while, because the one student that he recommended for active duty which had my ex-fiance make the point that he must be a really lousy teacher then. Anyway, this one student has been captured and he has to get her back because she's one of the few people who's gotten into contact with, again, our bad guy, Davian, a sadistic gunrunner whose real motivation and Kind of, just, we, we never really learn much at all about him. So, yeah, we have a villain that's cool enough, but not really, you know, all that memorable or, you know, distinguishable. And that, you know, leaves us with, well, hopefully there's, you know, a, a nice strong emotional core. And unfortunately, there really isn't. The film really, really tries to, you know, correct the mistake that the movie before this one did by actually making us care about the woman. Because it's, once again, you know, we're supposed to care about Ethan and, you know, you know the woman he's with, Julia. And it's not really her character, it's, you know, her character as it is, is a decent enough character, and, you know, more or less, they spend enough time on her to establish her and have us, you know, care a little bit about her existence, but it's really her, excuse me, her relationship with Ethan that's supposed to make us really care. You know, we we like Ethan, so by extension, we want him to be with the woman that he's with. You know, we want her to be safe. The problem is, as my girlfriend pointed out pretty well, I'm usually not a good judge of this, but I kind of agree with her. They have no chemistry. They just, I mean, what, part of it, granted, Part of it is that seeing Tom Cruise be this in love with anyone, even if it's not Katie Holmes, is kind of creepy. But that really isn't all of it. They just really don't come off as that impeccable of a couple. You know, they're just not that... But anyway, so with this, you know, we have a sort of... You know, we have a new theme to this franchise, which is, or franchise, this this particular movie series, at least. I don't know if they dealt with it in the 60s series, but, you know, we have the conflict of having to juggle a double life. You know, Ethan, you know, as set up by the previous movies, is not completely, you know, bound by his responsibilities with the... IMF. 
In this movie, they actually outright, you know, they really spell out, yeah, IMF and its impossible mission force, you know, and just... <sighs> bye bye, dignity. Anyway. He's, you know, he's always wanted a life outside of his spy duties, and in this one he's completely, you know, he's really running with that. You know, he has a serious relationship, and of course he can't tell her what he really does for a living. You know, an early scene has him, you know, emotionally affected by the job, and without it really being completely overt, they, you know, they establish that he wishes he could tell her, you know, it's, it's, it would be such a relief for him to be able to talk to her about how his job is affecting him, but he can't, because he cannot tell her anything about it. And that is a genuinely interesting conflict. I guess part of the problem is just that it's not explored all that well. You know, I I very recently, as you might already know, watched rewatched Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and that movie actually does deal with it really well. You know, part of it is maybe also that it's a comedy and, you know, humor is sometimes a very helpful way of dealing with subjects that are kind of difficult and a little risky, it's, you know, stuff that you really have to dig deep into, and, you know, when you sit down in a movie theater, you might not want to dig deep, but if it's kind of funny to watch at the same time, you might be more interested in it. And this one, it's not funny, and it's not explored that well, so what we're left with is just the emotion, and that in itself would be fine if it wasn't Kinda sappy. I'm really not kidding. We actually have scenes in this movie where out on a mission, Ethan yammers on about his relationship with his girlfriend. You know, it's not completely like, you know, it's not 14 year old girl level stuff, but it's still kind of, I don't know, it just doesn't quite work. J.J. is, you know, known for just a couple of shows, was, especially when he made this, known for just, you know, three shows. Lost is really not particularly applicable here, even though Giacchino does rip off some of his own score from that. So, we're down to Alias and Felicity. Alias would seem like the obvious choice. Yeah. Yeah, a spy with a double life trying to juggle family and spy stuff. Yeah. So one really has to wonder why J.J. did make the questionable decision of implementing so much from Felicity instead. There is so much sentimentality and just yeah, muddling in this, you know... Again, just the emotion of the whole thing. Maybe it would make for a decent enough movie, at least for the the female crowd. You know, I'm hey, I watch movies that are very specifically directed at males. I have no problem with there being movies spe very specifically directed at females. That is perfectly fine. But this is an action movie. You know, there are actually points in this where, you know, I'm pretty sure the males in the audience were kind of wondering if their girlfriend had tricked them into watching, you know, a sappy romance movie, you know, with the promise of Tom Cruise and action, you know. And then there are other parts where the action itself is actually pretty good if at times it's kind of filmed like J.J. didn't completely realize that he wasn't limited to TV anymore, but still, we do get some nice visuals, and it certainly is an intense movie. That's actually, that's one of the better parts. It's, you know, J.J.'s talent for creating these very 
dense situations with a lot going on, you know, fast dialogue, you know, very energetic camera without it being completely, you know, disorienting, although this does, you know, one of the earliest action scenes in this is actually how loud it is is in inverse proportion to how well you can actually follow what the heck is going on. The action is pretty good. It just... Yeah, there are some situations where really what what we're seeing is just a bit of a letdown, which you know, I guess people weren't entirely used to JJ letting you know his audience down at the point that this came out, but we'd be pretty well accustomed to it a little later on, you know, as the years and the seasons went on. The, but yes, so, you know, basically a lot of Felicity in there, but also some Alias. And that seems like it should be a really good thing, but I don't know, somehow it just, the movie ends up feeling like a really long Alias episode with just less reason to care. And I guess, again, it partly goes back to just the emotional core, which in Alias is pretty well-founded, I would say. So yeah, you end up just wishing you were watching Alias instead. Unless you really don't like Alias, in which case you'll hate it even more. Yeah, you know, we even have, you know, someone... Billy Crudo basically fills the handler position, you know, Agent Bland, I'm sorry, Vaughn. And, yeah, Tom Cruise partially takes over for Jennifer Garner. Thankfully, Maggie Q takes over the dressing up in hot outfits portion of the Sid character. I really don't think this movie would have done as well as it did, I think, if they had catered to the rather limited crowd who actually want to see Tom Cruise in the bikini. <sighs> Ving Rhames returns, still not all that interesting. You know, he's cool, but it's Ving Rhames, you know. He, he comes with a side of cool in every movie. He's, it's, it's like David Keith, or, you know, yeah, it's just cool automatically. So the movie really can't take credit for that. There are two additional agents on the team, Jonathan Riss Davis, I think, yeah, something like that, and, again, Maggie Q. Put together, they almost have personality, although what little personality they have, they actually sort of switch at one point, you know, they, they trade, I guess, yeah, maybe there's some sort of contract. The dialogue is pretty good. The mystery and such is not bad. It's just really the the anticlimax, the, the disappointment of it is just, you know, I've, I've watched this movie four times now at least, and I keep forgetting, excuse me, forgetting things in it and just not excuse me, not really finding myself caring all that much, and that's really... It's rare when, you know, a an Abrams production will have that effect on me, and it really, you know... It's not that many viewings, so it should still have some sort of effect on me, and it, it never really did have that much effect on me. The pacing is fine enough, although, you know, parts of the movie really feel like they could have been kind of cut out without that much really lost from that. One thing that is good about the movie is that it is at least partially a spy film. You know, maybe sort of half action film, half spy film. 
you know, Ethan and the others do actual very spy type things in this and it can be pretty effective and somewhat well thought out. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.